Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focused Compounding, sitting next to Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great for everybody else as well. If this is the first time you are tuning in with us, hit the subscribe button. Check out all the content we put out on the internet, investing content. Follow me on Twitter at Focus Compound on Twitter um, and leave us a rating review that goes a very long way for everything that we do here. Um, if you like the service and the software that we use, the website that we use to pull financial data and all of these videos and the podcasts and we demo everything out through the software, uh, go to quickfs.net and when you do sign up, tell them that you came from Focus Compounding and that just helps uh, support uh, everything that we're doing here on the podcast. So in today's episode, we are going to go over insurance companies. We've done a bunch of episodes on banks specifically. I think we've talked a little bit or dedicated a couple of episodes to insurance companies, but somebody actually had emailed um, you you directly um, and they referenced a post that you wrote up for Focus Compounding titled How I Analyze Bank Stocks and basically asked if we could do a podcast uh, basically going over how we analyze insurance companies. Okay. So we have QuickFS. I don't know if this will probably be one that you want to watch on YouTube. Uh, we're going to pull up the numbers and stuff. But basically, I mean, let's start from, you know, step one. Mm-hmm. What's the first thing um, that typically stands out to you when you look at an insurance company um, that, you know, could qualify for doing deeper research? So this might be easier for most people if they start with something that's been written up by someone else before. So you're on Value Investors Club or Corner Berkshire and Fairfax, something like that. You read about some uh, insurance company. So they'll lay out their kind of reasoning for why it might be interesting because a different insurance company is going to be interesting for different reasons. Um, that's not normally how I suggest people do it. You know, try to read the 10K without having all that, but that might be the easiest way to start. Um, so like we talked about Universal, which is a uh, Florida homeowners. Uh, so that's a lot of hurricane risk. And then you kind of get in the mindset of evaluating that and evaluating those kinds of risks. We talk about progressive. So that's something that people can understand that they're underwriting um, uh, mainly uh, private passenger stuff. Um, so I would start there and then look at things like um, in terms of metrics, you know, look at price to book and things like that. I don't think that Those are the most important for looking for an insurance company. I actually think a good insurance company often should be worth more than book and a bad insurance company, especially with, with management you don't like and stuff should be worth less than book. Okay. So like how much would you say? I mean, banks, for example, we think good banks could be worth, you know, two to two and a half times book value. I mean, what are your thoughts when it comes to insurance companies? Right. And that depends on compared to other stocks, you know, so why they might be worth that much in an environment like today is, is obviously returns in other stocks might be low, you know, Mm -hmm. going back 40 years or something. Other stocks were cheaper, so they're more competitive with that kind of thing. Um, I would say it depends. Um, I did a uh, wrote a letter to the board of Bank Insurance, which has gone private, uh, but in that I argued that they were worth at least book value. And honestly, I was saying you know book value because I was talking to the board that was trying to take an offer for less than book value. Do you remember what they were trying to take it out at? Um, well. It, it actually uh, B A N C insurance. Yeah, no, I th- oh. I'm trying to read it because I actually did put it up on the free content site okay. of Focused Compounding. So I just everyone really, can read about yeah. like a little bit of a case study right. from it. Um, but the uh, um, yeah, so I mean the the stock the the shareholders equity increased during the year, mm-hmm. so it's a little more complicated that way. Um, but I guess it would have been, let's see, it, it was trading at like 550 or so. I think they had an offer for 650 was the original offer and that sounds right. And then they eventually did 850, but the, um, the book value would have increased during that time over mm-hmm. $9 probably. So they still were taken out at some discount to book, but my, um, uh, my, my point with that was, um, can you try like BCIS or bank insurance, B A N C like spell it B it's not a public company anymore. So it won't show up on quick. FS. Yeah. I didn't know if they had uh, yeah. this, um, in here. So what you're saying in focus, if you on. have it, it would be B A N C insurance, like uh, all one word, all one word. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Got it. Uh, so I, Yeah, there you go. So we do have it on the website Mm -hmm. and it talks a little bit about it. Um, So that's just a good example. If you can see kind of my argument for why I thought it wasn't worth 
less than book value. Here you go. Yeah, case study. Jeff's investment in bank insurance. Right. So, so if you're watching on YouTube, I'll put the link in the okay. description. So, I mean, I don't think it's important other than that uh, to understand kind of the logic I was trying to lay out about why would an insurance company not be worth less than book value, even though many insurance companies are. And this company had a long history, three decades or so, of mostly profitable underwriting. And so that's one way you can think about it. If you think about an insurance company, it has two parts, right? Um, it has the underwriting part of it where it actually makes money or loses based on taking in money and immediately uh, pretty much mm -hmm. um having a loss experience that's going to cause them to have uh be able to collect premiums that are more than that or less and then on top of that you also have the use of float and so that use of float uh, this is something that buffett talks about all the time is is that use of float costless to you do you have an underwriting profit all the time bank insurance basically had an underwriting profit all the time and so my argument would be that under normal circumstances if a insurance company generates some float which they did you could see they had a large municipal bond portfolio if they generate some float and they have an underwriting uh, margin that's positive that is a combined ratio less than 100 so they're making money as an insurer plus they're making uh plus they have use of float that logically having a uh having float you know being able to borrow money at less than zero percent uh means that that sort of um, portfolio should really be worth more than the amount uh that it says is worth to shareholders sure. so than the net worth that it has on the other hand if your combined ratio is always above 100 then it may be worth less now we can argue about that I'm not sure it is worth less. You know, if you had the ability to have a very large portfolio and borrow at 1% um, to finance that portfolio, then maybe actually it's still worth more than book value. I don't know. But I think logically it's hard to argue that if you consistently have an underwriting profit, you should trade at less than book value. Having said that, some investors will say you could still be worth a lot less than book depending on how that portfolio is invested. Right. So if they took all of that invested in a bunch of government bonds, right, um, then to an investor on the outside looking to buy the insurance company, the return equity is still going to be really low. That's an interesting question to debate, because if the company is controlled and it chooses to do that, then theoretically, that's right. You know, if you have a return on equity, that's say six percent a year and you're looking for 10 percent type returns in stocks uh should you ever invest in something with such a low return equity unless it has a very very low price to book but on the other hand if someone else changes how they allocate the capital at that insurance company then the return equity will go up and so there's other things to consider like you know leverage and um and the, the what they're investing in the portfolio and in this case those weren't really big factors because, I mean, they had some, uh, their tax rate would have been a bit lower, I guess, because they were a heavily municipal bond portfolio instead of investing in like corporate bonds or something like that, that some other insurers might do. But um, their leverage was fairly low. Uh, and their underwriting leverage was very low, it was about one, and um, which is very low for a company that has, you know, in um, more than 90% of years, an underwriting profit. And then also uh, they had good ratings from AM Best and things like that, which are things I've suggested looking at. Mm -hmm. So it, it was pretty conservatively run from the, the leverage perspective. Um, so you could imagine someone else, you know, um, you could imagine if it was part of Berkshire Hathaway, it would have a higher return on equity, I guess is what I'm saying. Do you remember what their combined ratio was? Yeah, their combined ratio on average over the last 30 years, I think was in the low 90s. Um, if I remember in 28 of the last 30 years I looked at it, it had been below 100. They had a couple years that were very high. It's worth mentioning, though, part of my investment and not something I really talked to in that letter about is uh, actually the high combined ratio was related to other lines of business. So they would have as a company a poor result on average than the core line they were writing all the time, which is another sign that it could be an interesting insurance company. You would obviously prefer they lose money in something that isn't their core uh, business line, sure. you know? Mm -hmm. um, the thing I compared to, I talked before about DreamWorks Animation, right? So DreamWorks Animation, same sort of idea. You have a library of stuff that you've already made of movies, and then you're making movies now. If you're making movies now, and on average you're losing money when you release them, you don't make them back in the initial release window and all that stuff, and you put them out on DVD, they don't make money, but then you get the use of the library. You can kind of think about it as, no matter how much money they lose up front, there's some value in having a library. But shouldn't a library be worth even more if you can make money as a studio um, on new movies? 
And so if you can at least break even on new movies and then make money on your library, you should be worth as much or more than studios would pay to buy libraries that don't have a um, any uh, uh, front list business, basically. They just have a back list. Uh, and the same sort of thing with insurer. Like, is the writing new business? Is it making money? In all cases that we'll look at, um, there's always going to be float. There's always going to be obligations that they have going into the future to pay off, and they have assets now for that. Mm -hmm. And there are even companies that specialize in buying insurers and runoff and all that sort of thing. So my question would be, like, how would you think about so the type of insurance that right. they're writing and mm -hmm. the riskiness of that, and then also the investment side of what they're doing as well, and if you view that as being risky. I mean, Gainsco, for example, right. the type of insurance that they would write would probably be what more risky i would probably say than like what geico is doing well yeah i mean it, it depends so, so gainsco was doing and then their investment portfolio was in more high higher yielding uh right like i would you know junk bonds sure well. so comparing like gainsco to progressive or something it was a riskier uh, uh business mm -hmm. yeah i would say that that's true progressive borrows they use quite a bit of leverage they're they're the amount of premiums they write compared to their actual equity is high but otherwise i would say gains co in all ways was riskier yeah um combined ratio wasn't really as stable they were writing i mean i think a lot of people focus on the risk that they're writing as being high risk like that they were focused on um non-standard risk in in um auto in particular they were focused on minimum coverage right but um progressive started out in that area and then over time has moved closer so that now Progressive and Geico are more comparable to each other where Geico started and preferred and, and Progressive and, and non-standard. I, I think if you specialize in that risk and you understand and you've been doing it for a long time, it's not a problem. I'm not that worried about like, you know, people, a lot of times I think people on the insurance stuff reading the 10K will focus on, does this sound like a risky thing? You know, like in, in um, I know, uh, um, Berkshire Hathaway in a few of their letters very briefly when they talked about the Gen Re deal and all that they said that Gen Re had some losses related to um, movie uh, to, that had to do with the movie production and stuff like that I think some other things related to that so Hollywood stuff that they were ensuring that went bad um, that would presumably be high risk stuff but I'm guessing that Gen Re took all sorts of deals all around the world um, that would be hard for us to evaluate on the outside and they thought that they had an edge in doing it um, mm -hmm. and they were probably willing to take risks that others weren't and all the sorts of things that Berkshire Hathaway reinsurance does so what do they say there's no bad risks it's just like bad pricing well that uh, is allegedly the um, the motto of uh, right Jack Ringwald at, uh, yeah. at National Indemnity mm -hmm. yeah um, yeah and so, and Progressive, you know, so they they ha would have had a year, um, it's almost 20 years ago now, uh, that was bad in terms of combined ratio, but I'd forgive it because honestly, uh, all their competitors were at least as bad. It was just a terrible year for pricing in the industry. And so you're going to have to see that. Actually, I think you can see in the return on equity even. Yeah. Um, there was, I think that is that year. There was a very bad year there. Um, but it was bad for everyone. And so I wouldn't blame them for that. Um, so, I mean, if you have a relative advantage, and I'd say if you look, in most years, Progressive has a really good underwriting record in terms of their underwriting, um, uh, their loss versus their premiums versus uh, everyone else in the industry. It's very good. They're very disciplined that way. Um, if anything, though, Geico is better on the expense side, so which is hard to develop that advantage over time. So when looking at progressive from like a, you know, quick FS thousand foot overview, mm -hmm. I mean, what are the first things that stand out to you? Well, price to book is the first thing that you're going to look okay, at. So 3.3 times. Right. And you can also look at price to sales. Um, we, you know, we normally talk about like premiums. And, and in fact, I would talk about written premiums instead of earned. What you're going to see in all the financial statements is earned. I'm always going to, when writing it up, be using written. We already have data on what they've written. So I don't think it's a good idea to, I mean, they've taken those risks. Uh, they haven't earned it. But th it's still something to keep in mind in terms of leverage and all of that. They can't really take that back. Um, so the information that you'll see here is always going to be unearned. And then the next year might be higher or lower. Um, that's a gap thing where they're lining up uh, the experience that they're having versus the premiums there. Whereas we know from float and all that, there's a timing thing with insurance where they're writing more than they could possibly earn right now. And then over time, they're going to earn that and you're going to see it there. So there's that lag. Um, so I'd use price to book and price to sales, which is going to give you some idea of how expensive the stock is. And if you do some other math, you actually can figure out other things too. So for instance, if you can see the price to book, uh, this is some advanced stuff, I guess, as a shortcut. If you see the price to book and you see it's a lot higher than the price to sales, 
Well, P crosses out, all right? It's the same in both cases. We don't have to know what the price is. It's P. And so that means that uh, book over sales means that their sales has to be a lot higher than their book in this case. Um, their, their book is a small fraction of sales. And so actually we can calculate from that uh, some idea of how much they're writing in terms of um, their their gap equity. What you're going to see normally is like um, the number you might focus on, the assurance might talk about is, is premiums written um, versus statutory surplus. But it's not going to be that different than what you see there. Um, so they're writing a lot is the answer. You're going to see other companies, like if we were talking about um, bank insurance, if we had looked that up and it was a livestock, the price to book and the price to sales would have been basically the same. And that would have told you that they're writing at about one times, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, price to book is obviously very, very high, but you know, uh, Berkshire, you know, Buffett has said there's a ton of goodwill in Geico, economic goodwill mm -hmm. that's worth a lot. And I wouldn't be surprised if Geico's worth similar to what Progressive is worth. Um, and it's on the books at Berkshire at a small fraction of that. And you can see why, because it has, you know, numbers that you would like in terms of return on equity and growth. Mm -hmm. Just like banks, I think, in the long run, you should value things like banks and insurers if they continue to have success in compounding. At the same way that you would value, you know, a industrial company or brand company or whatever that has similar growth and return on equity um, characteristics. And so if you're having a return on equity of 20% a year or something and you're growing 10%, 20% a year, you should be valued like a growth stock. And you can see now progressive is a few years back when I wrote that report, I felt it wasn't being valued that way. Um, it was being valued more. Uh, and sometimes you hear that argument, right, about financial stocks that people think they should be valued differently. Sure, yeah, everyone refers to that when it comes to banks. And sure, they should because many banks insurers grow at almost zero percent, mm -hmm. but Progressive grows at eleven or whatever that is, and they've grown by a lot more than that years ago. So they're a growth company. They've always been a growth company. Geico's always been a growth company. How would you? What are the factors that you think about when judging management at insurance companies? So that's more into the thing with Gaines Co. So when you were talking about being risky or whatever, it was never an issue for me. And that company was bought out at a much higher price. So the stock would have been a big and success. And it's, it's interesting, you know, hindsight being 2020. I mean, when you wrote about Gaines Co. on uh, focused compounding, you actually wrote about, you know, how things drastically started to change at the company yes. over the past, you know, like three to four years. And right. it's like, well, is this, if this is how the new normal, then this company's cheap. You know, right. what does that look like? And, you know, in retrospect, maybe they were doing that to, you know, get a good price when they were going to sell. They knew that eventually, probably a couple of years, they wanted to sell the business. Which could be, or it could be that the buyer, which was a major, major insurer. State Farm, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, had, um, had, they may also have expertise mm -hmm. and knowledge of the industry that they were in and the states that they were in and liked what they were seeing. Mm -hmm. So you always have to factor that in too. Yeah. Um, you know, they, all these companies are insuring people in the same state and they would have some information on that and they might like where those trends were going. And it may be that th the previous poor numbers were related to other stuff that, that um, has been resolved basically, mm -hmm. that the market is a better market now. The, you know, Gainsco a long time ago had some other problems that I think were like management problems and things like that. They changed that, we knew about that. But what you're talking about is even just a few years before, they might have a year where they had a combined ratio of let's say 102 or something. And then they get down to where it's like mostly hitting 96 or 95 or something. That doesn't sound like some huge difference, but you have to understand that even a few point difference, you know, a, a move from uh, let's say 97 to 94 and uh, the combined ratio is going to have on the same level of premiums, a 100% increase in profitability, especially for that company where they weren't making a lot on the investment side. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, but in terms of pricing and stuff, think about that. It, you know, that could be a very small difference in pricing. So it may be that those years that sometimes were very bad years um, and understandable that they had losses then. With Gainsco, I didn't really understand if it was something that had to do with were they getting better at not paying certain claims that were, that were somewhat legitimate and stuff like that um, in terms of legal things and stuff related to that. That was part of it. But the other part was I, I wasn't sure if they were maybe a little too aggressive in terms of capital allocation, all that, then I might like. And that was mainly, you were seeing things where they would pay out these large dividends, special dividends, instead of maintaining capital at the insurance company level. And see if they had maintained it at the insurance company level, then they would have been able to have a higher AM best rating and all of that. You know, it, it doesn't matter because people who are looking for um, uh, the minimum amount of auto insurance in states like, you know, Texas and South Carolina, whatever, um, don't care what your rating is, you know, they're doing the legal minimum. Um, but in terms of doing other business and, you know, uh, with other institutions and all that, obviously it matters, you know, like, so for instance, a reinsurer, it's very important. 
that they have high financial strength and a strong uh, rating from like an investor or something. But even commercial insurance things, you know, for some insurers, they're they're you're going to want to use a an insurer um, that has some financial strength to them. Yeah. So judging the management, though. So, I mean, like if you were to analyze and, you know, think about and maybe this is harder, but for larger companies, a $58 billion company, I mean, what are some qualities that you would look for in like the guy that's running or gal that's running uh, Progressive or like Geico? Todd Combs, is he running Geico still? Is that a thing? Remember yeah. we talked about that before? Yeah, we did. Yeah. It was so subtle. And I was like, wait, what? What's going on? And I haven't heard anything else about that. Um, it, what's their attitude towards growth, um, towards pricing, uh, towards diversification? of the risk that they're going to take and things like that. So would they diversify into other states? Would they diversify into other lines of business? Things like that. The nice thing about Progressive, this is, by the way, is true of banks too. It's always easier and in many ways, I think a better bet to bet on management teams that are going to stay the same in much the same places, doing much the same sort of uh, business. A lot of times people will say like, oh, these people are financial geniuses or whatever. That may be true. But if they're making one kind of loan on one side of the country and then the next year they're making a totally different kind of loan in a different area that they haven't been in that market and they haven't made any of those loans, usually they aren't going to look like geniuses. It's concerning. Yeah. Sure. So uh, there may be skills about like capital allocation right and things like that that uh translate really well like they have a really wide range of things that they can translate into you can know that even a warren buffett buying into berkshire hathaway you could have known at that time buying into a textile mill he'll probably do smart things about taxes and you know turning inventory into cash and buying back stock or making acquisitions or whatever he would do smart things there but you'd have no idea about how he would do running a textile business right? like an operator yeah sure and if progressive was to acquire other kinds of insurance companies that don't have anything to do with what they're focused on, then then that would be a really big issue, right? And so Progressive is one of the rare examples, Geico is another one, in which this is a huge market of a very specific kind of insurance, so they don't have to really do that um, much that's out of their experience. They have a lot of experience with knowing what kind of risks they're taking. Most insurance companies you look at, definitely most more micro cap things, things that get written by Value Investors Club and all that, are constantly moving from doing one kind of thing to another, and that can be a lot harder. Um, there was one insurance company that people really liked and that I had um, read about, and and I liked what I saw, but the issue was it had mainly been, it had been in Nordic countries and then also a little bit in the UK and stuff, but it mainly been doing business where they became a very big part of, um, that their market share was big and they did it through brokers and, uh, they saturated those markets very quickly. And so while that looks good, it means that the next thing they have to do, they don't have like a very long runway. So they have to keep kind of moving into different things and, and um, them being smart in those areas. And it wasn't that they weren't smart in the areas they were in. They were smarter than the existing competitors. But these are in countries sometimes where there's, um, you know, five or six million people or something in which you're writing one particular line of business that isn't that big. Um, it would be like being in one U.S. state writing one kind of, it would be like a, being a title insurer in one U.S. state or something, things like that. Mm -hmm. It was that kind of size. And if it was a U.S. company looking at it that way, you know, each time they did that, you'd be worried. You'd say, okay, well, if they know a lot about, they're great at writing title insurance in, in Ohio or whatever, does that mean that they're going to be great about writing a different kind of insurance somewhere else? Usually not. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's something to worry a lot about. And then you have to watch for their, um, how things develop. And you won't know for a few years because they won't know for a few years because mm -hmm. obviously they thought it was a good idea when they wrote the business. Sure. Yeah. But it, even in very short tail stuff, it's going to take a few years before you see through the financial statements, the different problems and before they admit that. Um, and then, you know, like we talked about with universal insurance and all that, even when you know you have a pricing problem, it's not like you can pass it through in one year and keep all your customers and everything. So it's it's more of a gradual sort of thing. Um, so it's like turning a cruise ship. Takes about like what they say, like a mile or like a, a very long amount to turn around a cruise yeah. ship. <laughs> yeah. And they have a, so you have like a lot, you wouldn't want to lose existing customers that you have. So you do an analysis of, okay, if we raise prices by actually, I think, um, what is it? Uh, True Panion breaks this down, right? Okay. Where they say it, in cases, what's our retention rate? And they break it down. When we raise prices zero to 5% on existing business, what's our retention rate? When we raise it five to 15, when we raise it like, you know, 20% plus. Well, if you raise it more than 20% plus, their retention rate drops. Not a surprise. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure many people, when you've considered changing insurance companies, have done it after you've gotten a big increase. Probably when they told you your your uh, you rates it? dropped, sure. you don't uh, you don't check to see if you get a better quote. But because of that, there's a big customer. In the case of like Trupanion, not in all companies, but Trupanion is a good example. Uh, they have a big customer acquisition cost upfront. 
So when you have that, and Geico's talked about, Berkshire's talked about this with Geico that for the first, yeah, I don't know if it's 18 months or what exactly it'll be, but one to two years, um, it, it's a total not a good idea for their earnings to write the business. It will only result in lower earnings. But it's, you know, but in year three, they'll make a lot of money. So you don't want to lose customers that you spent a lot of money acquiring. So if you know that stuff, then you think, okay, well, if a 20% rate increase is a bit of a problem, but we want to have our rates at a certain level in a few years on this um, kind of risk, then that means for this population that we've got, right, maybe we should raise it 10% a year for a few years in a row. Mm -hmm. But if you do that and you turn out you're wrong, like let's say Trupanion guesses wrong and inflation in, um, in pet care stuff is a lot higher than they thought, right? Then you think you're raising your real rates by a reasonable amount, but you're not. You're behind the curve on that. And so even a few years later, you'll still be behind the curve. Um, and I have talked about that with a few people. I think people um, don't have a high enough awareness of the potential risks from inflation to insurers. It's different than banking. Um, it would be, f depending on the line of business, but for some lines, it would be very easy to have severe miscalculations caused by believing that inflation in what you're insuring is uh, transitory when it's not. So if you think, if you see an increase in, if you're covering dental or medical or pet or, um, or uh, like, let's say um, a lot of your payments are for uh, lawsuits that have to do with like people being hurt in trucking accidents and things like that. Okay. You're doing that and you think that this is temporary, that it's increasing at 5% or whatever, higher than what you were expecting. Um, what will happen is your combined ratio can get very bad very fast because depending on the um, type of insurer, you can be very sensitive to inflation. Um, and the reason why you're sensitive is that the inflation rate that we're seeing is a constant growth sort of number, right? So every year this is happening. This is not a one-time thing. And so you're experiencing it in two ways. One, you're experiencing it in the current year in which you were wrong by that amount. But two, you can experience it going forward by continuing to be wrong and by an amount that's greater than what you thought. And so um, I think there's a temptation, I know there is from talking to investors, that they think if the company was expecting 2% infl inflation and there was five, then that's going to be a 3% hit. Um, but it's not a 3% hit to premiums, which could wipe out almost all their earnings this year. It's also the fact that if you continue on that basis, um, it's going to be a continuing problem that you have. And that both affects you in the current period, but then it also affects you going forward because if that is a constant level of inflation. So that's absolutely true if it's a one-time miss on you miss guessing about inflation. But go back and read the things from Buffett and stuff in the say like 72 to 82 period or something, um, a lot of insurers had a very hard time because of that, because it was continually missing in terms of uh, inflation that way. Now, on the other hand, you know, you could have higher rates. So for something like progressive, if there's a lot of inflation, then obviously if they keep their money in short-term stuff, that offsets a lot of it. For other insurers, if they own longer-term securities, then it's more harmful in both ways. Mm -hmm. But it's something to watch out for and make sure that they're uh, that you're somewhat aware of what would happen to the insurer under um, under situations having to do with inflation. Generally, when I talk to people, they seem to only be aware of like interest rates on the securities portfolio, and not understanding the very serious like um, uh, loss situation that could happen because you're promising today to pay losses in the future, and at least auto insurers, you know, are repricing every six uh, months, but. You know, and the reason that they do that is they used to reprice once a year and then they had a really high inflation like the 70s and then they would reprice every six months. How do you judge the leverage of insurance companies? <laughs> it depends. I mean, if you, if they're rated by AM Best, AM Best will give a description of why they think that leverage is acceptable mm -hmm. the same way that like Moody's will for, uh, you know, if you're looking at a private equity deal or something and wonder is this over leverage. Um, it, it depends. The... I guess what I would say is one, you know, what is the level that they're doing? Uh, two is how, I mean, the real way that I would calculate is how much, how big a miss could they have in terms of pricing and then multiplying that through in terms of the leverage, how big of a loss could that be versus the equity? Um, I would say the biggest risk to an insured in my experience is similar to the biggest risk to a bank, which is people often price in the worst case scenario on like a one-time basis. But the truth is a very profitable insurer or a very profitable bank can handle that one-time sort of thing uh, much better than you might think. 
and uh, even if it means raising capital or something like that. But a company that has a very poor history of ever generating underwriting profit can't handle that one-time scenario at all because after that happens, they won't be able to generate those sorts of gains. If you, if you look at the bank insurance thing, they had a loss of, I don't remember exactly what it was, but let's say 25% of equity. Um, the next year, they their earnings didn't go down by 25%. Their return on equity just went up because mm-hmm. they wrote the same business because they had room to write that amount of business. Sure, yeah. Whereas like what we talked about with Universal or you could see here with the Progressive, Progressive, if they had a very large loss of equity, okay, um, they're, they have a very, very good long-term history. Uh, Geico had a very, very good long-term history, and that's why regulators let them write as much as they did to get in trouble. So maybe regulators will be with Progressive. But if you lose a lot of equity, when you're already writing, let's say, three to one in terms of uh, premiums to, to surplus, uh, you can imagine then if, you're, if your surplus was to drop by 30% or something, okay, then you're now writing it five times, not three times. Well, five times is not normally acceptable. Um, so you have regular the same way as in banking and stuff like that. If you have a long history, whether in banking, I mean, we've talked about all these books that you can read about failures of banks and stuff. Sure. If you have a long history of being a management team, a culture, everything that people think is conservative and that they has had good relations with regulators and everything, then maybe you get a little more leeway than one that they think that you're, you know, uh, a new outfit and crazy cowboys and whatever. Um, but ultimately the numbers matter a lot, right? That there's certain numbers that they want to see you hitting. And that would be true for ratings agencies. It'd be true for regulators. It will also be true for investors that understand that. Um, having said all that, you know, if it was a temporary type problem at a company like progressive, it probably can work its way out of it. You could sustain a very big loss and economically work its way out of it. Mm-hmm. Just like Buffett would say with like bank of America. Right, that was really bad what happened to it. But once he knew it was capitalized and stuff, he was willing to invest in it. Um, there's lots of little banks where that's not the case, right? Because you look at them and they've never had years where they had high returns on equity, so they can never grow back that equity. Something like Progressive, you know, um, let's see, what's their long term return on equity that you see there for the last 10 years? Uh, 18.8. Okay, and what's their long term re- revenue growth? Long term 10 year CAGR revenue 10.9 percent. There you go. So, because your equity uh, return equity is so much higher than your revenue growth, um, you don't even have to slow your growth that much in a scenario where your, your equity is now insufficient to write this amount of premiums and you can grow back into that really fast. If those situations were reversed, um, you'd have a problem immediately. And in fact, if your situation is reversed, you have to raise capital and you see that more with newer companies, right? Like I sometimes do read a write-up where they think that the company will grow at 20 25% a year. You know, if the return on equity has never been 20 25% a year, I'm not sure how that's going to happen. they got to bring in new capital or something, you know, or keep leveraging up every year. So Progressive's a $58 billion company. How would you think about in our world if you found a insurance company? So call it, uh, you know, sub, you know, below, let's say a billion dollars for insurance, maybe even lower, right? 300 to $500 million market cap. Well, we talked about a few. The one, I mean, I wrote up Investors Title Insurance Company. Yeah. And I think that that would be, um, it's in, well, first of all, it's interesting. We're talking progressive, which is car insurance. A lot of people think eventually car insurance won't be something people need mm-hmm. uh, because of electric cars. Title insurance, some people think we won't be needed because of uh, blockchain. But, it, it, but title insurance, um, uh, so they're a good example. If you look, you can you can get data through Edgar and stuff like that going way back. And you can see their history, how they started out in one state doing more direct and then expanded from that and everything. It, it is very much the history of um, what you would want to see. Uh, so it's um, yeah, ITIC. The ticker. Yeah, that's what it's the ticker, of. yeah. So now having said that, whether this is a great time or not to buy the stock is a little bit different question because there was a huge increase in, uh, in um, housing activity due to COVID and stuff like that. But putting that aside. 40% growth in premium. Yeah, so putting that aside, this is a company that grew to, do you know what premiums are now? Uh, what they were last year? Earned um, premiums, 205 million. Yeah, and um, I think when this company went, uh, the oldest filing in Edgar that they have for them is you know one uh, uh, less than one-tenth of that. So, and they've paid out, um, it, you know, they've paid out like, I guess, special dividends or something over time. But even putting that aside, it's a company that's grown more than tenfold using only its own capital. Yeah, look at the EPS on. from 2011 EPS, three point. Three dollars and twenty cents, um, and you know, up to yes, twenty dollars. Now, be fair, two thousand eleven was probably one of their worst years ever. Yeah, because Come title insurance of. losses come after a housing crash. Yeah, that, uh-huh. That's when people realize the defects and the costs that they have and everything. So they would have had a bad three years or so in there, and then they would have started to recover. Premiums probably wouldn't have picked up right away, 
but losses would have stopped happening. Um, so, you know, 2007 or something, it depends on if there was a lag, might have been their best year. And then you would have had several years that were bad losses. And then you would have taken a little while for premiums to grow because the housing market just grew so slowly. But last few years were good, right? Um, in terms of earnings growth and all of that, uh, last year was great. But I mean, even before then, you saw growth, you know, for a few years, mm -hmm. a lot of profitability. So uh, that's the kind of organization, I think. It's family controlled and stuff like that. But it focused on very narrow uh, kind of business. Um, title insurance is what we've talked about a little bit. I think it's fairly easy to understand. Um, there are comps. Uh, they're very big title insurers that are more national. Uh, what you probably overlook with this company is that they started in, uh, it was North Carolina, right? I Correct. think Texas yep. has mm -hmm. become a big market for them yeah. and stuff, but they probably are very, very big title insurer in their home state. And most of these title insurers that you find that are tiny ones are going to be actually big players in their home state. So they sometimes call them regional or something, but a lot of them are really one state that they got big in. Um, so it's not like they have a really tiny market share versus leaders uh, nationwide. It's just they're not in most of the nation. Uh, so that's the kind of thing I would look at because it, you know, and that's why we mentioned things like universal, which is, you know, ones uh, which they're diversifying, but same idea. All you have to really understand a lot about, about that is like hurricane risk in Florida, which is a lot to understand, uh, title insurance. You have to understand that, um, progressive, you have to understand, um, or private car insurance, uh, mainly they do a little bit else, but not a lot. And, you know, there's just so little else that you have to worry about. If you look at, um, uh, a lot of companies that get written up, I'm trying to think of one that would be more complicated. Uh, can you type in global indemnity, I think? Let's see if that's one I'm thinking of. Is that one? What does it say there? Yeah. So what's the market cap on that? $388 million. Okay. So the ticker is GBLI. If you go to the business description, I just want you to look at it from the business description perspective. If you read some of that, you can see what they do. Provide specialty property and casualty insurance right. and individual policyholder coverages in the United States and reinsurance products worldwide. Okay, but the actual specific things that they have where they start saying commercial specialty. Yeah, it okay. operates through four segments, commercial specialty, specialty property, farm, ranch, and stable, and reinsurance. Okay, so and you can look this up with this company's, uh, uh, do they have a presentation? I don't know if they have a presentation. I think they have a presentation, but they, they do have a, a 10K. Um, you'll see that it's pretty complicated in terms of what you'll have to figure out um, because some of the lines are not very big, but they are very unlike others. Um, you know, when they're talking about things like farm ranch and stable and stuff like that, um, you know, it's, it's hard to know a lot about that in, unless you've had any history in learning about that. And I haven't. And so then you look each year and sometimes one part of the business is doing quite well and other parts aren't. Um, what's the price to book on that? 0.6. Yeah. And then you could 4. also six return right. equity. And then we'll use the same test that we did before, which is to see price to sales and price to premiums. What are those? Price to premiums, uh, 0.7. Price to sales, 0.6. Right. So we learned that that means that we can figure out right away on something like QuickFS that they're writing about a one times mm -hmm. surplus, or in this case, one times shareholders equity. Um, and then we can we can see so not a lot of leverage that way at all. And then, uh, but you can see on the return on equity, it's not delivering much in the way of underwriting results because if you're writing at one times and um, you're getting returns on equity that are modest, sometimes slightly profitable, sometimes slight losses, um, then they're, then you're basically operating near a combined ratio of 100. Mm -hmm. This one, if, from what I can remember, and I should be careful because I don't know how much I uh, remember from reading about it because I decided not to write it up, uh, it did have some interesting aspects in terms of its reserve development and stuff like that. So they're, they're like they were over reserving or there are some indications they might've been kind of conservative, but again, I don't know the business that they're writing mm -hmm. enough and there's too much that's in different parts. So even if you learn really a lot about one, you don't necessarily have a lot on the others. Um, so there could be legitimate reasons for why you would reserve that much in some things, but in general, it didn't look, um, I didn't think it was bad what I was seeing. I, th mm -hmm. I thought that the, and so those those figures, it's sort of like banks, right? So those figures in a sense are not captured by their return equity stuff. If they're under-reserving all the time, that's a problem and yet it's not showing up in the in the earnings things. We talked about that once with a bank that I passed on and it went up a lot from about 10 years ago or so. Or so. And uh, with that, the only thing that was worrying me about it was how reluctant they were to charge things off. And as it turned out, they were they were right. They didn't have to charge them off, and they kind of worked their way through it. But they had a a lot of bad assets, and they 
had unusually high charge-offs cyclically, but manageable every year for like, you know, the next five, six, for no more than that, you know, six, seven, eight years working their way out of the housing crisis instead of having large charge-offs at the beginning. And it made me kind of nervous, but it worked out. Now, I don't know if it would have worked out if like interest rates hadn't been quite as low mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever. Sure. But that's the kind of thing that isn't captured in the financials. That's the thing that I'm looking at and going, why aren't you charging this off? And, you know, it, it turned out that they were okay that way. But then that makes you worry, do they really have enough equity and all that kind of thing? So you flip that. And in some cases, when they seem to be saying losses will be, uh, will have a lot of losses or whatever, and then they really don't, um, sometimes that means, oh, then maybe they're conservative, you know? Mm -hmm. They certainly didn't look overly aggressive, if I, if I remember this company right. Do you come across a lot of smaller insurance companies? I look at them. Yeah. A lot of them I don't like that much. You're going to find so a lot what of what turns you off. Like what is family co family controlled? So I was going to say a lot of the ones I see that are smaller. It's it's family controlled ones. Investors title insurance is family controlled, and I don't mind their capital allocation mm -hmm. or anything. And you've them. you know to be fair, you've said that it's something that you could be interested in more at the bottom of the cycle. Yes. Yeah. I don't think they want. Uh, I don't think they want to put a lot of information about the company out there. They're public and stuff, but I don't think that they're going to help explain the company to you. Um, there are other ones that will. Um, and uh, so so I guess that would worry. It. And then there's lots of things about that I don't think we want to get into all this and stuff, but there's all these things about like fronting things and stuff like that. There's some companies I think that are positioning themselves uh, to the investors, to investors as being very growth oriented and stuff like that. And I would be cautious about that because they don't, they're not talking about the same kinds of things in terms of insurance and in terms of the same things that would build lasting advantages. Um, they're, you know, they're, they may be more attractive as sort of a growth company that way. And I've seen some companies even that are only growing at progressive type rates, but people are excited by it because they're, they're disruptors in their mm -hmm. industry or something. And, um, you know, some of them may do fine and everything, but I just I would be cautious about that and understanding the differences and not just thinking, uh, lumping them all together, thinking, how is this insurance company growing really fast and these others aren't? I've seen some, and this also is the case with banks, where a family owns a lot of it, controls it, or has multiple shares and things like that, and um, it doesn't take much risk. And if you don't take, it uh, doesn't take much risk and actually has it under leveraged and, and stuff like that. And so if you're writing really low um, amounts of premiums to equity and stuff, then it's just a um, investment portfolio that you have, right? Now, Berkshire's done that at times, uh, at least with parts of Berkshire, where they've written at very, very low amounts. Like they, they've written at amounts that are, um, I'd say an average insurer would sometimes write at three to uh, six or more times, um, virtually nothing in, in some years, but a few things, one Berkshire's, um, investments or all investment portfolio was always good. It was in good stuff. It was in heavily in stocks that were going to grow picked out by Warren Buffett, um, high quality companies and equity. Some of these insurers uh, that are small and family controlled, uh, have low, aren't writing a lot of premiums and are investing in very low yielding bonds. And so their ac return equity is uh, constantly low and you don't see a path for how it's going to be otherwise. Uh, you'll see some life insurance. There's some tiny life insurers that do that. It's unclear like why they do it. If it's, you know, I mean, sometimes they're not the, they didn't create the company. They inherited it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if they really have a plan for what to do with it. They probably could get more money by selling out to someone else, but then you give up the family control and the salaries for half a dozen family members or whatever. Um, those could be some of the reasons. I think you see some of the same problems at smaller banks. A little bit more common for the insurers that are publicly traded, I think, than the banks. Uh, but I do see that problem sometimes. Yeah, you know? and those are more the ones that don't want to give any information to shareholders and want to, you know, have all that. You can just see some things probably about inefficient too. You know. Um, the same business could probably be done more efficiently and more profitably by someone else. And so like they would, if they're willing to sell, they could probably sell for a lot more. The risk is that they might continue to be a public company for decades. Right. And so that's why people avoid them. And you're going to see those have low returns on equity and they're mm -hmm. going to tend to trade a price to book of less than one, you know, um, having said that, Investor's title insurance, uh, I think 10 years ago, traded at well below price to book of one. And they had a good uh, record as a company and everything. So, you know, that's just a thing that lots of um, uh, investors will look at. We'll focus on that price to book ratio. Do you have that there for what it was 10 years ago? Yeah. I mean, now out of, you know, 08, because this is 2011, but it was 0.71. 
Okay. So you could have gotten around book or, or lower, you know, 10 years ago. And, mm-hmm. and that was a few years out of the crisis. I mean, by 2011, you should have known that the, the housing crisis was over and it mm-hmm. wasn't going to be the end of the world for this company. And yeah. they're financially were strong. Whether they return to growth anytime soon, I guess, would be the question. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you, you I would try to find insurers like that where you feel like there's some history of um, good profitability. Mm-hmm. Uh, they actually had fairly consistent in terms of their um, their margins for a long time. Uh, this company's had, it's a little complicated because of how they're doing it there in quick FS because they have a couple of different businesses and whatever. And I broke it out a little bit differently when I was writing it up, but, uh, pretty stable, um, pre-tax type numbers at around 15%. And then if you write it one-to-one and you think about making 15%, um, that's with earning a little bit on your float. But you know, if you're paying a third out in cap in, um, corporate taxes, which you're not anymore, but you were, you know, at a 35% tax rate or whatever years ago, um, you're still going to keep uh, enough of it to have a 10% return on equity on average or better. And that's without what I would consider much leverage at all. If you're writing one-to-one and not borrowing any money and, um, and paying a normal tax rate. And so this is a company that had a very long history, I'd say of earning or a very long history of it should have earned 10% a year or higher in terms of return on equity without using a lot of leverage um, in a normal year. Mm -hmm. And so to me, if you're going to earn 10% or higher on average, your price to book should not be below one. Um, you know, you think it's more appropriately priced at one, one and a half times. Um, yes. Tough to say after, I mean, compared year. to other, compared to other, uh, compared to other businesses, if anything, that's still a little cheap, honestly, because 1.5 times a uh, book price to book for this company probably made a lot of sense when you had a 35% tax rate. And when stocks were as expensive as they were, um, you know, 10 years ago, stocks are a bit more expensive now, uh, generally, you know, in terms of their multiples, mm-hmm. you know, discount rates are, are lower and everything. So maybe a bigger premium is justified uh, for a price to book on an insurance company the same way that your PE is higher on, the, on a, um, any, any other kind of company. And then also, you know, your tax rates lower. Uh, and tax rates, different insurers will have different tax rates because they're the same as uh, banks because they're actively targeting, trying to reduce their taxes in some cases. But of course, if the tax rates change, then you change how you do that, mm-hmm. you know? And so you should get a, uh, on tax equivalent basis afterwards, pretty similar. So I think, you know, on their capital allocation, I think has been pretty good. Uh, do they have information on their dividend stuff down there? Let's see. Yeah. Dividend per share. I think maybe we could get out, uh, see if there's more on the key ratios page for the payout ratio. So anyway, I mean, you can look and see that they've grown completely, um, completely through internally generated um, retained earnings for, uh, you know, 30 years or whatever. And at the same time, have paid some dividends, which is not important from the calculation of earnings and stuff. But the fact that you pay some dividends um, and grow as much as you do means that your return on equity is obviously higher than your growth rate. And so you can calculate that if this company grew at 10% or so a year for decades, which it would have had to, to, you know, go from writing, you know, less than 10 million a year in premiums to writing over 220 or whatever. Um, then you can just see that it's something that's been, you know, a slow growth, I guess you could mm-hmm. call it or whatever, but the 10% type grower for decades. Um, it's very different than a lot of other small insurers that we would look Diluted at. Diluted shares outstanding have, have gone down as well. Yeah. Um, it, I remember it definitely hadn't gone up. Have they ever done meaningful buybacks? I, well, yeah. 2016, they brought back 3.8%. Yeah. So I know that they hadn't had any increase in the share count. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you can see that, it, you know, but you can also see them in the overview. If you go to the overview, we can only see the last 10 years. But what does it say return equity was? Oh, you know, we may not know that. It says it's the same as revenue, but, you know, that might be capturing changes in the equity portfolio now. Right? Because insurers, they do that now. Mm-hmm. And so that, that is a bit of an issue. More an issue for insurers than banks generally although some banks have it so sometimes they report like core and non-core and stuff like that um uh what is it uh, uh, uh what is it um federal mortgage federal agricultural mortgage uh, agm yeah um would uh report that way you know break it out for you but yeah i think that that's farmer's kind of mac far, yeah farmer mac big mac <laughs> farmer mac <laughs> um so yeah because like for this company, Investor's Title, I was just realizing this. I don't know if this is how we've talked about before. So used to be years ago, 
as an insurance company, um, the numbers that you would see reported wouldn't be heavily affected by changes in um, prices of the stock portfolio because they wouldn't all be available um, for sale securities that would be moving around a lot. Having, uh, but if you have an insurer, and some do, hold a lot of uh, stock, that's particularly bad on a quarterly basis in terms of confusing people. And that I remember happened with Investor's Title. Um, they would have held a portfolio so that you would have seen that in the um, COVID quarter, right? And so when that happens, you're going to see a number that says like the EPS is not as good as you think or whatever. But um, in fact, by the time they release the quarterly numbers, they may already know that a lot of those stocks have gone back up in value. Mm -hmm. But you have this large loss. And for a company like this, uh, do you have the balance sheet? So just insurers, because they're, they're um, so the securities portfolio is how big? 198 million. Right. And plus they have cash and equivalents, which is, you know, same sort of thing. So we're talking about something that is awfully close to the premiums, as you, as you could imagine. So because of that, you have a, you know, what what's the market cap on the company is um, it's 1.5 times book. So it's 300 something. Yeah. 325 million. Yeah. So, but you have a 300 some million dollar market cap with 200 million in securities, even if it's very small, even if you had 10, 20% in, in stocks. Uh, fluctuation in that, like you saw in the in the uh, quarter when the market crashed, actually going through your EPS is going to completely distort what you see in terms of quarterly uh, results. And unfortunately for things like Quick FS and Guru Focus and all those things, it's always hard because then you look at those numbers and you won't remember, oh, that was the quarter that that happened. Mm -hmm. So you have to go back and look at it. It's unfortunate it used to be cleaner, the accounting. I wish that it was, you know, because that's something we kind of could figure out for ourselves that the balance sheet changed that way. But now it's captured in the income statement. Got it. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us here today. Uh, somebody did recommend this video. So if you have any recommendations for a podcast dedicated to a single topic, you could DM me at Focused Compound, or you can actually email me, Andrew at Focused Compounding. We use QuickFS for today's podcast, and we use it every single day. Uh, so if you do want to sign up, go to QuickFS.net, and in the checkout, it'll give an option where they ask where you heard of QuickFS, and uh, be sure to check Focus compounding. It helps support everything that we do here. I thank everybody so much for the support. Hit the subscribe button, give us a rating review, and we will see you in the next podcast.